Rally Driving with Bruce Garland. This is track 38 of the 4x4 Earth podcast. Join James from 4x4earth.com as he learns all there is to know about four-wheel driving, camping, fishing and getting out and exploring our great country on the 4x4 Earth podcast. Hey, hey, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. This is the second part of our really fascinating and exciting interview with Bruce Garland and some of the amazing driving that he has done around the world. So let's get right back into the action with Bruce and his stories of four-wheel drive rallying. What percentage of people would start the race and not finish? Probably 70% don't finish. Oh, wow. That's really high. 50 to 7, yeah, it'd be close. It depends. Some years are harder than others. And, yeah, I think the first year I went, technically only 15 or 16 did the whole course. But they, because it was so difficult, they let people restart again. And I think there was, out of the 190, there might have been 40 or 50. But really only 16 did everything. So... So it's got to be really, really difficult then, because that's um, when you've got putting in all of that sort of preparation to have yeah. so few people complete it. Well, look, that's the thing. It's not an easy job. So that's that's uh, that's, that's the challenge. That's why it's still been going. Since people keep going there. You know, the best of the best of every country in the world go there. And I mean, they're pretty particular with the bike entries. They've got to be. They used to just take any random people, but there's a lot of people get injured and cause a lot of drama because they weren't experienced enough. So now they had a criteria. They only take a certain amount from each country and you had to be a extremely high level of competitiveness in your country before you're al- allowed. You had to apply and then you have to give them all the results and events that you've done and then that if you're good enough, then you've got an entry. Yep. So... What's the process that you go through to, for modifying the vehicle? Because I'm assuming they don't race stock vehicles. There's a fair amount of work that goes into preparing the vehicle. Yeah, look, there's a huge amount of work. Well, you, basically, weight is your worst enemy. So you're trying to get everything out that you don't really that that's not necessary. They've got to carry fuel enough to do 800 kilometres. So then you need a your fuel consumption in the desert will in the sand dunes will be on the diesel I think we were getting down to about 3k to the litre the petrols the V8s are just over 1 so they've got those Hiluxes that you see in the Daco with the V8 in them, they've got 550 litre fuel tanks so That's half a tonne of weight as well Oh yeah, yeah exactly yeah, so we were only carrying about 240 250, we did about half of what they were doing you know, it's just the water. You've got to carry a heap of water. You've got to carry food. You've got to eat. You know, when you're driving non-flat out, non-stop for anything up to 12 hours without even getting out of the car, you've got to keep eating and drinking. And, you know, and some days you'll, if it's hot, you'll consume 10 litres of water each. You know? Yeah. And then you've got to be, because, you know, so just, if you start getting tired and you start getting thirsty, hungry it's already too late because it takes so long for your body to in that environment to process the water so you're really drinking before you need to drink so if you feel thirsty you've what you've waited too long wow so what else would you do to the car then like i'm assuming suspension uh, would be look, we did we with that car's quite a bit modified we put the radiator behind the cab a couple of reasons because when you land on the sand dunes on its nose so many times the radiator to get damaged Plus, we're trying to take the heat out of the engine bay and put it behind the cab so the cab doesn't get as hot. I mean, it doesn't work so good when it's snowing because we've got no heater. But the cab's quite reasonably cool. If you have the radiator in the front, uh, we used to do stuff in the, in the Middle East. We had a, a V6 in the Jackaroos, and literally it would melt the soles of your shoe. It'd get, you know, be in low range, full load for two hours. And it would get that hot, you know, under, doing under 50k an hour and full load, just grinding away through the dunes. It used to melt the glue on the shoes and they'd fall off and there were fireproof boots and stuff. So, yeah, it's ext- controlling the heat or managing the heat is one of the big designs of trying to make the car survive. 
five. Yeah, so you, you, you're looking at, you know, we've got changed the gearboxes, we've changed the brakes are bigger and better and that, that there's a certain limit on the tyres we're allowed, so we take it to that. On a four-wheel drive, it's only a 33-inch tyre. So there's a lot of technical rules that you have to comply to, you know, safety roll cage, that sort of thing, um, seats and harnesses. So, But there's nothing in the car that doesn't need to be there. I'm just amazed that you moved the radiator because that would be that's not a small engineering feat, is it? That's a significant oh, piece of work. Oh, that's the easiest engineering feat. We move the engine back, we move the body back on the bo- chassis, we move we move everything around to try and get the weight in the back, that best place back, lightweight battery. It's back and down and under the car, the tanks down as low as it can be and be safe. The spare wheels are sunk through the chassis right down as far as they can go. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that gets done to try and make it easy. You know, when you get bogged, how hard is it to, you know, have jacking points in the side of the car? So you don't want to, in 40 degree heat, you don't want to go digging to put your max tracks under the wheels. You have to jack the car so you can get them under because it's that bogged. So there's a lot, a lot of stuff in the, you know, you have, we have compressors in there to pump the tyres up because you let them down so low sometimes when you're bogged in the dunes you might go down to 10 pound and or even less and then when you go out into the rocks you've got to pump them back up again so there's quite a lot of there's a lot of thought how the car's laid out inside and stuff like that so it's it's pretty ruthless yeah it sounds it so how often would you have to do a because there'd be no one else to you wouldn't be allowed to get any assistance from anyone else for a recovery would you or can you uh, for recovery, you've got to be able to get yourself out. Unless you're down a ravine, uh, I'd won the one year the, the road was that rough. The nut behind the steering wheel vibrated loose. And the, I didn't realise that the steering wheel had come loose and had stripped the inside of the steering wheel out. So I had no steering, and I'd lost it. Went off into a ravine, and it was stuck, jammed, literally jammed in there. And we couldn't get it out. This so truck came along and um, and yanked us back out, but. Most other times when you go off the road and get stuck or you're stuck in the dunes, you just just work it yourself, the two of you work on, on jacking it up and putting the ramps under and launching it. And you'd have winches and things like that as well? No winches. Winch is too heavy and there's nothing to winch to. Oh, really? And you've got to do it quickly. So if you get bogged to the gunnels in the in the sand dunes, like I mean talking when you, when you open the door, the, the door's hitting the sand, that's how deep. Yep. It has to get, and it's really super soft in the middle of the day. The dunes uh, get really fluffy, so it's a lot easier to go through in the morning and the evening. And the same dune, you just can't get through. In the, it's nearly impossible in the middle of the day because the dunes fluff up that much. That um, Yeah, but we, if we're bogged on a crest of a dune or somewhere, usually we can get out in six to ten minutes, you know. Wow, because, yeah, well, you, you don't want to be stuck there for too long, do you? No, sometimes you might be, it, it, it can be a little bit harder. You know, it depends, you know, some, but look, it's, it's and then you've got to aim for a spot to stop. So you don't, there's, you know, you don't just stop as soon as you get out because you get bogged again. So you've got to put the, you know, you use gravity, you're trying to get up on a hill or try and find the hard sand. So in the sand, that's why interesting so interesting to drive in the sand so you can be you can go three meters and, and get perfectly hard sand and you go another meter and it's back into a, like a quicksand you know so picking and learning to pick what it looks like those sort of things you know, picking your route and those sort of things so when you get bogged and you've got to put your ramps in then you launch and then the navigators so you don't want to go too far because the navigator he's dragging all the ramps and everything back to put in the car, so all, all that's all designed, especially in the d that we have, you know, it's all easy to get, put the ramps in, put the jack in, it's all only seconds to get them out and get them in, they're not loaded up and down, and hard to get at, so. Mm, that's really interesting, because you don't really see a lot of that on TV, do you? No, no, look, if they showed you how bad it was, they probably wouldn't get too many entries. <laughs> They tell you all the front dudes, and they do show a bit of the dudes going through the having a bit of dramas and crying for their mummy. He when you ha- when it's all going wrong and it's stinking hot and you're in the middle of nowhere, and he you set, definitely go into a different part of your brain and go think, what the hell am I doing this for? But then when, when you get it out and going again, it's you forget about it. 
but you, you, it's way, way, you get way, way, way out of your comfort zone. So most people' comfort zone is quite a narrow band. So once you've been doing Dakars, your your comfort levels can go to the extreme before you get worried. There's a there's a so whole different mindset. How do you mentally prepare for that then? Like, how do you get uh, comfortable with being outside of your comfort zone? I think life experiences give it to you. You know. I've been married with four kids, so that's one way to get outside your comfort zone. <laughs> They're all growing up now, but, you know, yep. it, there's times in life that you just, yeah, it's just said to try, but they, you build on those things and put your head, put your shoulder out, think about it and go, okay, I can do that better next time. And that's why, you know, the first time we went into the dunes in the Middle East, it took us half an hour, an hour to get out, you know. We nearly died from the heat. Now we can get do that. If we did that same thing, we'd be out in five, ten minutes, you know, just because we've learned lessons along the way, you know. So what are some of those lessons? Because, like, I, I would love to do some of that big June driving. You see videos of it on YouTube, and I, I just reckon that that would be one of those bucket list kind of things to be able to drive one of those those big dunes like that. I think once you learn how to get recover your car yourself, your confidence goes up because you just go, well, if I get stuck, it's, I, just, I don't want to get out. I don't want to get out and get in the heat and jack it up. And, you know, I don't want to do that. But, so that's a good thing to drive you to learn to drive quickly, efficiently, you know. So I think those things of, of setting up, and, and the only way you can get, the best thing is to have a, four max tracks because as soon as you get them up on that, you can get out of anything. Yep. That was the biggest thing. The first time we went, we only had, we didn't, we had some old, a uh, bit of aluminium tracks from World War Two type of thing. And the thing used to slip sideways. If you're on a bit of a slope, you'd go to take off and it would just slip sideways. They weren't ideal where the max tracks sort of just pull themselves under. And once you get them started and moving, you can launch off them. I think that was probably the most positive thing, I reckon, having them back in the, whenever they came out, early 2000s, I think. Yeah, I think you just learn there's a way to go through the genes, there's a route. The Arabians are, are experts at it because they grow up in, they go out for picnics in massive dunes. They go out for the day and sit in the dunes or in the afternoon, watch the sun go down. To them, it's, it's their playground and they, you watch the way they drive in it and, and when they crest a really big dune and for that one or two seconds that you're cresting, they're already looking, they know which way they're going to go before the car lands for the next half a kilometre or a kilometre like that. So it's all it's about breaking it down into, don't get overwhelmed, just break down into the next bit. Where's the next safe bit where I can just have a breather? So, yeah, look, it, it, those things, once if, if I sat down in the sand dunes and said, OK, just have sit down here, watch way the wind's mainly blowing from, that's the way the sand dunes form, like a big surf, you know, the wave and the air. The sand comes off the top of the dune and the really heavy sand drops straight down the face of the dune, and then the super light stuff, it flies a bit, and it'll fly anywhere depending on the wind, 20 metres away from the dune, and that's where you get the really bad soft stuff. And once you learn, once you get bogged in there, if you say, look, that's the way it was, there's there's the the wind's blowing the sand dune, that's why it's shaped, and if you look over there, there's a bridge that runs across to the next dune and that's a good spot there so very similar i suppose when you if you go out on a surfboard and you use the rip to get out the back of the waves and you have the waves finish and down into the rip and then they join to a neck that it's it's very very similar and once you learn how to look for it and where to go it's it's heaps heaps easier and i guess one of the other things you'd need to be thinking about is um rollovers as well if you because you've got a bit of momentum as your friend i'm assuming as you're going up yeah look there's that's the, the bad dunes you know the difference between getting bogged on the lip and 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 for ending it on the other side can be 10 kilometers an hour it's that close you know it's like so there's a bit of a technique where you, you always slew the car as you go over the top everyone goes says go straight but if you watch the good blokes the ideal thing is if you're in the right-hand draw seat driving, not a left-hand, but if you're in the right-hand side like we are, you'll tend to crest the dunes from right to left. So 
at an angle, and as you go over the dune, instead of looking over the bonnet, you're looking out the side of the window and you can see what's happening before you land, come back down again. So there's a, there's a way you throw the car and then you straighten it up. So you, you don't be scared of going down the dune sideways. It's, the main thing is don't touch the brakes. Yep. Where, you, where you'd normally want to touch the brakes is when you've, where you've got to put the throttle on. Mm. It sounds like fun. It sounds like epic fun. It's a lot of fun. When you get it right and you get, it, you get a rhythm going, it's unreal. You know, when you go up a monster dune and you go up at an angle, cause not at a straight, because straight, the angle of the dune is steeper. So you cut across the face of the dune at an angle. Well, it'll get that steep that the car won't go anymore and you'll feel it starting to slight, nearly stop and bog. So you don't take your foot off the throttle. You just turn back down the dune. So, like you're doing a re-entry on a surf, surfing. So you you just re-enter the dune and then go back down and go to the next one and do the same thing and come back. So you build your momentum, come back at a different angle and then have another go at it. So sometimes to go forward through the dunes, you have to go backwards. Yep. What are the comparable sort of events in Australia to the Dakar rally? It would have been the Australian Safari they were running since the mid '80s, and then they stopped a couple of years ago. I used to the last few were in Western Australia. They have the same sort of dramas, and and our our outbacks a lot different. It's a lot rougher than most other countries as well. So we've got different things in our country that other countries don't have, and it's quite beautiful out there. If you've been out there, you'll know it's a um, fantastic place to visit. And yeah, I think. You know, some of the short events like the Fink Desert Race are good for, for practicing speed in the sandy tracks and things. And um, but yeah, that, we unfortunately the safari doesn't run anymore. What happened to it? Extremely expensive event to run because of the logistics. You've got to have helicopters with ambulances, and you know, the, to get all the permits to comply to run an event like that now is, you know, it might cost. One point four million dollars to run to just to run the event and the entry fees. There's not enough entry fees to pay that, so they need government support or sponsors to help. And you just it's difficult to get to get that sort of money, and that's the problem. Unless you've got a government backing through their events corporation or something like that, you can't really afford to get an event that that big. You know. Mm, mm. We've been doing this for a while. We'll be going back to like sort of the the Red X trials. We had the Red X trials, you know, we were one of the first countries. I think they, they did things like similar to that in, in South America as well as our Red X trials. And that's the sort of safari grew from those events. And when it first started in the 1980s is when the four-wheel drive market started really exploding in Australia. So there was a lot of people who want to adventure. Now, those adventurous type people do things like uh, Red X bash and the... Uh, kidney car rally and things like that so they're going to similar places yep but it's not as extreme and car destroying and you know because you're driving the car at the speed you have to do to to win or to even just to keep in the race it's extremely difficult extremely hard on maintenance on the car so you might have a perfectly good car that you've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on and you do one race and by the time you finish with it it ain't much good anymore Mm. So, you know, you have to rebuild them again to go and do it again. So It starts getting it, expensive, doesn't it? It is expensive, but it's a spend level. If you're just going to have some fun with your mates, you can do it at a safari, you can do it at a lower cost, but you won't be able to win it. You won't, you won't have a chance of winning it. You know, it all gets back to hard work and money. Sometimes you don't need as much money if you're good at working and good at solving problems and things like that, but... It, it, the equation's always there. But to go to the Dakar, it's all cost heaps of money because the organisation is, is so expensive to enter. You know, they have their own, like a blow-up medical hospital at each bivouac with x-rays and things like that. So it's huge, huge. You know, we, a safari might have one, heli- we'll have one helicopter. Dakar might have six or eight helicopters and um, with doctors in them and emergency people and stuff like that. So the logistics behind the Dakar is multi hundreds of million dollars to just to run that event is is massive as well. So they're lucky they get the support from the country's tourism. So they'll they'll be chipping in a lot of money to get the keep the event in their 
country. Just looking at some of those, the pictures of the deserts in Chile, it looks absolutely amazing. So uh, I'm sure there's hundreds of thousands of people who go to Chile just to have a look at those at those dunes and and probably drive in them as well because they they do look absolutely epic. Yeah, they are epic. There is tours. I know they do bike. There's a lot of Aussies that have gone over. You can do bike tours in Chile that take you up into the desert, and you can go up there in you know some four wheel drive tours. But a normal four wheel drive can get some of the way through the dunes, but they can't do places where some of the places they send us. But you know they're not in a hurry as well, so that makes a difference. You know if you're not getting a time limit, then you can take your time to get in. So some, so I'll give you an example. When I did a stage in Africa. The Tourags in their camels run a salt, it was a salt route, so they had a salt mine in the middle of the Sahara, and it used to take 21 days for the caravan of camels with big, these big slabs of salt yep. to go. To, we'd do that in five hours. Wow. So that's a sort of different terrain, that, but a normal car probably would take five days to do it, if they could do it. So... If you unmodified cars can't go to some of the a lot of the places where events like the Dakar or the Desert Challenge, they just don't um, they can't handle the heat and the extremeness of the thing, you know. It does sound epic, though. What did you do? Did you have a day job while you were planning all of these rallies? I've look. Sometimes I've been. Enough that we can get enough budget where I can plan and do be building the cars. I've always been involved in the building and design of the team and the planning and everything. But the Dakar was the year and a half. The first time we went to South America, I was full-time working. I had a couple of staff and then it got up to about eight preparing the team for because we had multiple cars and spare parts. Because where we're going... They don't even sell on Isuzu. Well, then they didn't sell on Isuzu D-Max. So you have to pretend you're going to the moon because there's no parts there. And if you have to fly the parts in, it's too late because it'll take three or four days if you can get them to the... And by that time, you're out of the rally. So you have to have spares of basically everything that makes the car move, go up and down and keep the car going. You have to have spares for and then the normal maintenance stuff filters and air filters and oils and spare some parts of the car get a high consumable brake pads and drive shafts and things like that because they're under extreme load so you have to quite a bunch of them so you have to prepare all those items as well yep yep and so what's your background a mechanic or uh look i, yeah, I started uh, when i was out of school i was an apprentice mechanic and then i went I work for Colin Bond. I've worked with or with a lots of top line tra- rally people over the decades. You know, with teams in us here in Australia and in Europe, and I did also I've done all sorts of things. So it's all in automotive, and then it's just I've worked with some of the best engineers in the world and um, picked up on that. And then I picked up on how I, when I was driving, things you learn to do the best better way. You know. Yep. Yep. Like stuff breaking, so you learn well that didn't work. So. How do we make it so that doesn't fail again, you know? Wow. So how do you... Yeah. So you couldn't... The results that we've had at the Dakar and other events in the Desert Challenge, the events overseas and the stuff in Asia that I've done is only got those results because of the other things that I'd done previously to that. What was driving in Asia like compared to South America? It's a little bit... It's different on a crazier level. The jungle, like, we'd be... The stages weren't quite as long. They were quite tough, but we'd be doing, you know, racing in the rubber plantations and that, and then they'd send you down the highway and then back into another one. But it, there was no... Oh, this, you've got to go... This is... You're still racing. So they had this thing. If you come into a village, you had to blow the horn to make sure there was... People got out of the way. So it was... It was... Uh, it was quite, quite. No one got hurt. I mean, a few chickens got run over, but the um, cra- absolutely crazy. Like, like, a, like you see in the movie, Gumball Rally sort of stuff. It was just seriously crazy, but a lot of fun and a lot of hard to track in the mud. In the when you get the afternoon torrential rains in there, it just the ground just turns into 
unbelievable slippery mud and hot and humid and things. So really good experience, but way different to everything else. Sounds epic. Well, thank you very much for, for sharing some of those experiences. And um, I'm going to do a little bit more research about some of those sand dunes because, uh, yeah, it's they do look epic. And I can imagine just how much fun it would be to drive something like that. It would be epic. Yeah, look, it's, it's, it seriously gets the adrenaline going, especially when you get to do it right. And, the, I mean... The closest things we used to have was Stockton Beach here. That was that had, but that was still that was nothing compared to the dunes in the Middle East or the the ones in South America or some of the other places I've been to. You know, they're just. But it's not a bad place to go and have some fun and practice. But they've restricted some of the areas up there now, which is a bit of a shame. It is, yeah, it is, and it's a bit harder to get in there, which is really quite a tragedy because it, it. I was there probably about four or five years ago, and yeah, epic. And some moderately big dunes. They're, no, they're quite small, but the, if you get, you probably drove behind the first lot of dunes up Stockton Beach. But imagine getting on top of the dune on the ridge and driving all the way from the, from down near the the, the wreck, Cigna, what it is, on the top all the way up to Anna Bay. Yeah. And that's about 25k, and do that for 600k. Epic. Well, thank you very much, and yeah, we'll put some photos up in the show notes so that people can get an idea of just how big those dunes are. Yeah, okay, mate, no worries. Look, thanks very much for having me on. No worries, thank you. I love hearing stories like Bruce's because it really does inspire me to go out and, you know, A, to get out four-wheel driving, to make the effort to actually go out and do some four-wheel driving, but on top of that, I'm really excited about the prospect of going and four-wheel driving in places that are a little bit less, the more unusual four-wheel driving places that are out there. It's an amazing world. There's some amazing four-wheel driving out there. And that's the thing that I think is really cool about four-wheel driving is that once you get off the beaten track, once you get onto a four-wheel drive track, there's going to be a lot less people out there. So you're going to a place that is not available to be explored by your everyday driver. It's only the four-wheel drivers are going to get out there, and the harder it gets, the less people who are going to be out there. So that's it. So don't forget, leave a review on iTunes. It really helps us to get the word out. Don't forget to check out the 4x4 Earth store merchandise. I'll leave a link in the show notes. Every purchase helps us to keep the 4x4 Earth server uh, ticking over. That's about it. Uh, Hopefully, I'll see you out on the track someday. Bye. 4x4earth.com is used by over 200,000 people every month to find great tracks, organize trips, and find out how to better enjoy exploring the great outdoors. There's over 1,000 tracks and 300 campsites ready for you to explore. So check out 4x4earth.com today and sign up to get access to the track information, ask questions, and meet other 4x4 earthers. Membership is completely free. If you're looking for a good route, check out 4x4earth.com today.